Yes, now we are good. Cool. All right, so Eddie, would you like me to proceed from where we stop? Uh, just track back a few minutes before you started the presentation. And yeah. Okay. All just right. like uh, a small about yourself. All right. So uh, the name is Alemo Emron, as you can see on the screen. Um, first of all, thanks to Eddie for uh, inviting me to, to, to join you guys. Um, I work as a group creative director at Ogilvy Africa, uh, supervising creative output uh, it, from our headquarters here in Nairobi across the continent uh, for a range of brands. Um, so I think uh, the, the, the question Eddie uh, really wanted me to answer was what happens now, what happens after COVID? Because there's still a lot of uh, unclarity about, about uh, where the situation is, is taking us. So great thing. I happened to have a presentation that I had uh, ready uh, uh, that I was discussing not too long ago. So I'll just, I'll just share that and talk you through some of my thoughts. Of course, um, if there are any questions, if there's um, uh, any, any disagreements on anything, feel free to state this is just a conversation. It is a sharing of an opinion. Uh, so I'll just share my screen right now. So um, I believe you all can see my screen. And I'll just go full screen with this. Uh, Eddie, do you mind confirming for me if, if, if the screen is visible for everyone? Uh, yes. Yes, great. it's coming now. Great, great. So um, ideally, this is a presentation I did not too long ago about how we'd have to adapt messaging to changes in consumer behavior that have been caused by uh, COVID. So to get started, ideally, I think we had to observe the patterns because it's not one answer or one size fits all. Um, we have to see the progression of the communication from the time COVID uh, became an issue to now and where I think it's ideally going to go. So there have been different phases. There have been changes in the messaging during this period of time. And I believe the first phase, um, brands played the role of uh, the responsible citizen or the big brother, reminding people to take COVID seriously and do the right thing. Because if you do remember when COVID was first announced, there were so many measures being uh, instructed. Um, not everyone was... Uh, was towing the line. And there was also so many bits of information and disinformation. So the first thing brands really had to do was to come out and tell people, hey, look, this is a serious thing. Please make sure you wash your hands. Please make sure you stay at home. Please protect yourself. So it was that responsible tone. So that's where we started. And um, I think one of the best examples of this would be what Lifeboy did. So Lifeboy, of course, as we all know, with COVID, one of the key messages was washing your hands for at least 20 seconds to help uh, uh, protect yourself from the virus. And Lifeboy did a very simple ad, which uh, was more like a, a public service announcement. And beautifully, their angle was not about trying to sell Lifeboy. They made it about you protecting yourself. If you notice, they just, they didn't even, in some other parts of the world, they mentioned their competitor brands, saying don't just wash with our soap, but wash with any soap. By any soap, make sure you protect yourself. Um, South Africa Tourism did a campaign telling people not to travel now so they could travel later. And that was brilliant because when the authority on tourism is saying, look, let's step back from what actually feeds us and uh, push a message that actually goes against our revenue stream to help people realize how serious the situation is. And of course, social distancing was being preached and almost every brand, you saw almost every other brand do the social distancing logo, whether it was McDonald's, Volkswagen, Audi, so on and so forth. Nike even did the same. 
So at this stage, brands are all playing the responsible citizen. You'd also probably have seen a lot of brands on the PR side of things, not the creative side of things, actually contributing to, to government funds or funds that were helping uh, fight uh, the virus. So they were playing the responsible citizen, big brother, telling you, hey, man, this shit is serious. Don't play around. Take this thing seriously. Yeah. And locally, uh, some examples, uh, NCBA, a brand that we have at Ogilvy Africa, uh, did change their splash screens. We did communicate telling people their health is premium. They should stay home, providing them solutions that enable them to stay home and stay safe. So that's where brands started off. Then we went into the next phase where brands were being a bit empathetic and were being that cheerleader that almost like the cheerful aunt, you know, letting people know that they understand their plight and stand by them. And, you know, when I refer to the cheerful aunt, I think we can all relate to that auntie we have. doesn't matter what the function is, whether it's the barbecue, whether it's the funeral, whether it's a birthday, whether it's a wedding. She's just bubbly. She's around. She, she has the big hugs and the, the big laughter and the big smile. And she's checking on people, asking about them. Every family has that one aunt who everyone loves, who just brings a chair. And if you're having a bad day, you want her right there because she's going to pick you up. And if you're having a great day or celebrating something, you want her right there because she's that proper, you know, cheerleader who who ups energy when it comes to um when it comes to 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 whatever mood you're in. You know, she can always pick you up. So brands took on that particular role in the second phase, which came after the, the, the very serious beginning phase. And I think the one example I really like to talk about is, um, is uh, Dove. Dove did their Courage Beautiful campaign. And what made this beautiful one, it stuck within what the brand is about, because Dove is about real beauty. And also, it did not try too hard. It did not try to force itself on people. It fitted right into the brand ethos and was done so seamlessly celebrating the frontline workers without you know force fitting it so this was great and brands were doing this and you saw so many brands people clapping on their balconies people celebrating people who are doing great things brands really trying to tell people hey man we know things are thick but we're there with you we're here to support you we understand your situation being empathetic then the next uh uh phase ideally would be uh the, the heroic or the silent hero, the parent phase, where brands will be providing solutions to real life problems uh, and ideally without chest thumping, yeah? So we saw brands now going beyond communication and focusing on solutions. Not ads, but ads. Like Airtel, for example, decided to zero rate uh, access to education sites across the continent. Um, a lot of luxury uh, perfume brands, Givenchy, Louis Vuitton, Christian Dior, they turn their, perfum their perfumeries, their perfume production lines into uh, sanitizer production lines. So again, not an ad, but an act. Not communication, but action. So that's a phase that we went into, and that actually about four or five weeks ago, and still now, was the key phase most brands were in. And every meeting and every brainstorm was not about how can we get a piece of ad uh, uh, ad information out there or an advert or something on our social media platform that will get people amped. It was about how can we use our resources to actually help people. Remember first phase, they were telling people, hey, man, they should take this shit seriously. The next phase, they were like, look, man, we understand your situation. But in this phase, it was really about we understand the situation and this is what we're trying we're doing to actually try and help, yeah? And um, Nestle and Freshly partnered in the United States to support uh, uh, at-risk seniors in, 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 uh, in particular neighborhoods. Um, the Björk Engels Group, Nike, Apple were producing face masks. The Björk Engels Group, uh, if you do not know who they are, just go online, look for Björk Engels, brilliant architect, any creative, especially our art directors out here will really love the way he puts beauty, but then function into what uh, um, what he creates. Björk Engels, just check him out. Amazing, amazing uh, architect. Um, Facebook, businesses were struggling, couldn't go out, so substitute floor space. I can't get floor space, fine. Here's Facebook saying, here's Facebook shop, substitute your floor space for cyberspace. You see, so providing real solutions to people's problems at the time. And it's something a lot of brands are still doing, 
it is what most brands ideally uh the, the phase that most brands are actually sitting in because it got to a point people were like you know what we're tired of the empathetic messaging we're tired of the ad that goes about we're uh, we're in unprecedented times thank you very much we know this can you help yes that's what brands had to do and earlier in our discussion eddie if you do remember i was talking about providing solutions over and above just communication and this is a perfect examples of what i was referring to now post covid so again i remember i said phase one they had to tell people yo forget about us it's about you stay safe then they went on to say look man you're staying safe great a couple of years struggling we support you we believe we we will offer moral support then the third phase became look okay cool uh moral support is not enough you, some of you really need real help whether it's providing food whether it's providing free data access whatever it is we're actually going to use our power and our resources to support solutions acts uh not ads solutions not communication yeah now post covid let me tell you i can tell you easily what's going to happen brands are going to switch up to this motivational space why people have been down people have been struggling people are out of jobs people's businesses are um if you i was talking to one of my cab guys the other day he does three months he's been sat at home he says it doesn't make sense for him to come and park outside the office there's no business you know he doesn't know what to do i was reading in the papers this one guy who used to sell soda outside the sankara uh, hotel he used to sell a crate he says now he comes to town with the hope that he'll sell one or two sodas he says on a good day he makes 300 bob and his wife who used to work um in a hotel now has no job so with 300 bob he has to take care of the family and it's 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 a struggle so what brands are going to do is they're going to come out and tell people let's get back up on our feet kind of like the coach i don't know those of you who've gone to the gymnasium to work out and so on you have a coach who just when when you just can't the guy who's there you know yeah he's like come on man give me another 10 you know give me another 15 you know get back up i know you're tired but you can give me another 10 more minutes you know you can give me 20 more squats or or 30 more push-ups whatever it is brands are going to be doing that urging people to get back up on their feet and um i will not be playing video but i'll request those of you who are watching or listening just if you have a pen and paper go find these ads i'll tell you what the ads are go look for them uh perfect ad is uh it's halftime america it starred clint eastwood the contest the context of this was after the last uh major credit crunch the um, automobile industry in america about 2012 were were really struggling and trying to get back up on their feet because people came out of the credit crunch saying look we have to be more cautious about how we spend our money like i was telling you eddie when people come out of this corona situation individuals and brands are going to be more cautious about how they're spending their money so people came out of that situation the last credit crunch of 2007 8 more cautious about how they were going to spend their money and they were opting to purchase uh imported japanese cars over the typical american gas guzzlers so american auto industry was really suffering and unfortunately for america the, the auto industry does support entire cities if you think of detroit detroit is motor city a lot of uh manufacturing of automobiles happens there so it's not just the industry was suffering but it was jobs and families and entire communities and cities so um this ad campaign was put together with clint eastwood beautifully delivering a message telling america look it's half time and this was played at the super bowl 2012 it's halftime America, time for us to get back up on our feet. Yes, it's been hard, but it's time to get back up on our feet. And a lot of brands are going to go into this space right after uh, uh, we get out of the COVID situation. And just like I mentioned to you, there was fatigue with all that messaging about we, we are with you and um, uh, we understand your situation in these unprecedented, unprecedented times. There will probably be fatigue with this, because every brand more or less I'd say 80 to 60% of the brands will come out with communication like this. And after maybe a month or two or three, many consumers are going to be like, cool, we get it. You want us to get back up on our feet, but how? You know, we, you know the thing is people are going to be trying. Getting back up on, on your feet is not a one size fits all. People, some people are going to be trying and failing. And look, any of you who has tried to do something and failed consistently understands that one of the most annoying things when you're really trying and still not making it is someone consistently telling you hey man you need to try harder you see 
So brands will do well if they go this way, motivating people for the first month, second month, third month. But after some time, they'll have to rethink how they go about it. Because even right now, people are already asking for more uplifting communication. Not a reminder of, of the situation that in, not a reminder of the problem, but a reason to, to, to laugh, a reason to escape, some form of escape. And um, it takes me to what I think will be the most successful angle to take. If you're creative, pay close attention to this. This is ideally where you should be taking whatever brands uh, you'll be working on post-COVID. The ones who will win are those who decide to pick people up. They'll take a pick-me-up tone. They'll play the best friend, the, the best friend role. This is what I call the best friend phase. Um, yes, they will be customer-centric. Yes, they will provide value for money solutions, but laughter, laughter, laughter. Now look, customer-centric, why? You cannot sell to consumers what they will not need. Well, whatever product you're selling or solution, it will have to be tailored to what people need. So your best friend knows what you want. Your best friend knows what you need. If there's anyone trying to set up a surprise party for you, ideally your best friend would be the right person because they know you well. So just like I said earlier, we'll need to interact with people to understand them such that we can recommend to our clients what consumers actually need during this period of time and not waste our time trying to sell them things that they do not need. Yes? Value for money. It's your best friend who's like, yo, let's not go to the bougie club. I know a little dingy club down here where we'll have a blast and drinks are half, half the price. Value for money is going to be key. People are struggling. People are trying to hold on to the little that they have. They're going to be very conscious of every cent that they spend. So yes, brands are going to be like a best friend in that they will have to provide best value for money. They cannot cheat the consumer. They cannot overprice the consumer. They have to give the consumer what is best for their pocket. But now laughter, laughter, laughter. I repeated it three times. Why? Because the best friend, again, whatever hard time you're going through, your best friend is not just the person offering you solutions, but the person you can go through these hard times uh, with while laughing. Doesn't matter how bad shit gets, your best friend has a joke that will pull you out of that stuff. You, You'll have no cent in your pocket. You'll have just lost your job. You, you're having the worst time. Your girlfriend also dumped you. Your landlord just evicted you. But if you're with your best friend, there's a high probability he or she is going to say some shit that's just going to, at least for 15 minutes, one minute, one hour, two hours, just help you escape from all that negativity around you. And I'm speaking out of experience. I have a very good best friend who, when I was going through some shit when I was much younger, was there not really helping because he was struggling just like I was. But man, this guy had jokes to just help me forget all, all the bad times. So brands will have to do that for people. And look, um, it's not just my opinion. Let's, 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 let's think about research. Like I said, laughter will be king, yes? Um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples, yeah? Um, as I said, laughter will be king. Let's, let's talk about some uh, patterns here. This Airtel to Bonge film, which um, uh, Eddie spoke about actually at the, at the very beginning, is a film that was well received, a film that pegged off laughter. Like people found it hilarious, people created their own renditions. I do not think it's a coincidence that this came a year after uh, an election. Now look, there was no election violence per se, but typically an election year comes with different issues for people, monetary issues and many different problems. So usually a country, especially in this part of, of the world, um, in the, in the, in the, on, the, on the African continent, countries need to get back on their feet after elections. So when people and businesses are trying to get back on their feet, it's no coincidence that in 2018, the ads that did best in Kenya were the ones that were hilarious, yeah? Humor, after uh, a trying or during a trying period. Let's think about this ad. Now, look, guys, um, just go look for Samuel Eto'o Cameroon empty and if you haven't seen this ad there's a French version there's an English version any of you who likes film any of you who likes something quirky you're going to you're going to love the hell out of this out of this film yeah now this came out I believe in about 2015 or 2016 I do not think it's a coincidence that this comes out a year after Cameroon starts its um, I think it was the, the anglophone crisis that ended up becoming really bloody and I'm not sure if they've recovered from it but they're still going through all this drama with their political issues. So again, chaos, hard times, humor, 
MTN did this piece in, in, in Cameroon. It worked well from, for them. And a lot of other brands in that particular year actually uh, relied on humor. So when things are thick or when things have just been thick, people need humor. They will relate to it because they need to escape. They know they need to get back up on their feet. They know they need to work harder. But they also need that moment, that, that breather to take them away from all that drama. And again, look, I've told you about Eto and I've told you about Tubonge. And I can give you so many other examples on the continent. And, you know, you could assume or argue that, look, okay, that's your opinion. Fine, but let's, let's, let's again talk about patterns, yes? So white label comedy. It's a, it's a collective of uh, social media, uh, digital media, and, creative, uh, and, and uh, uh, creative copywriters and comedy writers. They did a ranking of the 50 funniest commercials of all time. By of all time, I mean since the very first commercial was ever done, okay? And this is what I found very interesting. At number 10, Pepsi Max, The Office Interview, 2009. Yes, the year after the credit crunch. Compare the meerkat, number eight, 2009. Old Spice, the man your man could smell like. And by the way, guys, again, if you're taking notes, let's just go back. Take Pepsi Max, Office Interview, please see this ad. Just after this, just go to YouTube, check it out. Compare the meerkats, a beautiful series, also 2009. Check these ads out. Almost everyone has seen this one. Old Spice, the man your man could smell like. 2010, yeah? Dollar Shave Club, our blades are effing great. 2012. Spec Savers, this is one of my favorite ads of all time. Uh, Spec Savers, Sona, 2011, okay? These are the years right after the credit crunch, when the world is trying to get back on their feet. And that's when we have all the funny ads coming out, yeah? Now, let's just count one. Two, three, four, five. Yeah? I do not think it's coincidence that of all the greatest ads of all time, five of the top 10 are coming right after the last big crisis we had. The funniest ads, five of the top 10 of all time, of, of the 50 of all time, came in the period when we were trying to get back up on our feet after. Uh, one of the, the last big crisis of our time, the credit crunch. So humor, guys, will be king, yeah? And after that, please note, again, um, as it stands, what you need to be doing right now is focusing on learning how to do acts and not ads, how to have action or solutions instead of communication, because that's a skill set that will be required once uh, the world opens up post-COVID. So yes, you have to be funny, it will, it will help, but you also need to be able to provide solutions beyond uh, just communication. And I know a lot of you might be worried about what's going to happen. Look, as long as you're adaptable, the biggest skill beyond uh, understanding how to, to, to come up with solutions that are not just ads or, or communication will be adaptability. Because the situation will keep evolving and evolving very quickly. What it is this week will probably not be what it is next week. So stay fluid. I, um, again, I think I, I like to believe a lot of you have seen that, that little speech by Bruce Lee when he said, be like water, my friend. If you haven't, again, just write that down. Just Google Bruce Lee, be like water, my, my friend. That ability to be fluid and adapt to all kinds of situations and learn very quickly is going to be essential. Uh, and then, as I said, laughter. So right now, uh, actions, not uh, communication, acts, not ads. Laughter will be key after, but adapt adaptability is going to be your biggest and strongest uh, skill set. So yeah, that's 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 the way I see it. I guess uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, I'll just stop sharing my screen right now. Over to you, Eddie. Yes. So guys, remember Facebook. Uh, I can see a few guys on Facebook as well. Remember, like anyone said, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask if you want. You might you can unmute your button. So just feel free. The, the room is free. It's a conversation. If you have anything whatsoever that is bugging you, how you think, uh, maybe Emiron could explain humor better. Because there's also the clown humor, you know, there. 
ha 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 when you become so funny you end up yeah. being a clown rather than spreading the message that you have spread oh yeah so if you have any question whatsoever yeah, so um i'll just talk about human i think it yes. is something yeah. you raised in the past uh there's a big difference between being a clown and a stand up yeah. comedian okay so uh slapstick very much charlie chaplin very much clown kind of comedy charlie chaplin was great then uh but the stand up comedian for example the stand up comedian as i i remember we spoke earlier we said you know uh be that awkward person asking a lot of questions ask as many as many dumb questions as you want to when you're out in the pub like look feel free to be weird and just stalk not stalk people but say okay that's illegal but um uh be a people watcher observe people because humor that really works is humor that holds up a mirror to society when you look at the tubonge film and mashakura ideally it was us saying this is actually what society is and people could see their cousins they could see their relatives in there they're like oh, i can relate to this but then it has to be some form of social commentary there has to be a message behind it if you watch any stand up comedian and i love stand up comedy for one key reason there's always a message it leaves you with you see slapstick or clown comedy you will laugh and that is it you will move on and life will go on but i've never once watched a clown and as a kid i used to and i'm not trying to snitch on how old i might be but on tv they used to be like clown ferdinand and all these different clowns and it was just that you laugh and you move on but when you when you watch dave chapel and when you watch um eddie murphy and when you watch eddie griffin there's a message when you watch cat williams when you watch kevin hart there's social commentary behind that so don't be funny for fun for fun sake or for funny sake be funny to deliver some kind of message and you can only do that if you understand people otherwise you're going to write jokes or you're going to write films or you're going to write scripts that are funny to you and maybe three or four of your friends because you're talking to yourself but when you talk to so many different people you start to understand what they want to what they want to hear and what they they find funny yeah well i i'm i'm glad you brought that up but before we got to the questions you've said that we need to interact and i remember when you're starting this you are talking about how now that covid has changed everything how we interact with people yes you know there's not that physical touch anymore so maybe you could just point out to those guys who are not there during the meeting what you mean by interactions now in the post covid era okay so you see and again again it's not like go have a focus group and ask people questions but the opportunity to talk to people presents itself at any given point in time if you're on the back of a border doesn't stop you from asking that border guy about his life personal questions you'll be surprised how how willing people are to, to tell strangers a lot of personal shit if you're in a cab Look, in number three it might be a bit dicey. I would hate it if I'm sat in number three and someone's asking me questions. But look, we're creative. Society gives us the 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 the, the liberty to be awkward. So feel free to be to be awkward if you'd like to if you'd like to be awkward and ask questions. When you're buying food and you you interact with your mama boga, she's packing the vegetables. Ask her a couple of questions. How are the kids? How are things? Oh, where do you live? Look, some people might tell you to f off, but you'll be surprised how many people are willing to actually give you information. So what that means is when you get a brief or when you're trying to provide a solution that has to communicate to that type of person, you already kind of have an understanding because you've interacted with that person. And look, the same applies to people above you. So many times people are like cool I'll talk to the border guy I'll talk to the mama boga it's fine because I need to understand a lot of brands want to talk to the mass market the bottom of the pyramid but what happens when you get a brief that requires you to communicate to someone who's upper echelon that ex- requires you to communicate to the dollar millionaire have you actually spoken to one no maybe not unless you happen to be one or live with one or no one personally but you've been to more than enough functions Well, there's a dollar millionaire in the corner or something and yes look they can be intimidating but you'll be surprised how much they might be willing to talk to you because you know what Mr dollar millionaire in the corner who's the guest of honor for this whichever function that he really didn't want to come to has so many people surrounding him trying to kiss his ass and you know and 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 make him put him on a pedestal you the little awkward creative kid coming with questions that is not asked regularly 
might actually be more intriguing to him or to her. And look, the reality is we'd like to think, yes, um, like before I was drinking whiskey, I was writing whiskey ads. But then it's only when I began drinking whiskey that I understood what I wanted out of a whiskey that my ads became better. Now there will be there will be um, um, briefs that will come and require you to to communicate to a dollar millionaire. Now I'm not saying you go and tell your CD or you go and tell your CEO, look, man, I get it. Uh, this brief requires uh, me to communicate to a dollar millionaire. I don't know any dollar millionaires. I'm not going to do this brief. No, of course. Then you get fired. But it doesn't hurt to just ask. If you see one, ask questions. Look, sometimes on social media platforms, try and friend some of these people. You know, uh, Eddie and I became friends of, of okay, we, yes, we met at the hackathon, but we continued communicating on, on social. So you reach out, yes, I know, Eddie, you, you could have reached out, I could have been a, an a-hole and said, no, man, I don't want to talk to you. But guess what, I did. So sometimes some people, yes, will be a-holes, uh, some will not. And they will actually be willing to listen to you and, and answer all your questions. So learn, learn people. Be a student of people, of society. How do people behave? How do they talk? What do they want? What do they laugh at? Don't be the person watching the screen and laughing with everyone. If you're in a room and everyone is watching a funny show, be the person watching the people, not the screen. Understand these people, because if you want to make them laugh like the person who's making them laugh on the screen, you need to observe what made them laugh, then you see, okay, that was that on the screen. Observe the people and how they react. It will help you a lot. Super. So I think we'll go straight to the questions. You're going to take that part. Okay, cool. I can, I can get into some questions. There's a question here from Amala saying uh, she read a certain report that was very strong on the emotional approach rather than humor saying humor in such times might lead to awkward brand moments. So again, it comes down to how you, you disseminate this humor. You see, um, you cannot be disrespectful when it comes to, 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 to humor. And again, humor, they're very fine lines. You see, understanding people. There's one line on your script could turn your ad from disrespectful or disconnected. Uh, to 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 brilliant, you understand. Removing one line or adding one line could shift uh, drastically how people will take your 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 piece of communication or whatever piece of humor you're trying to put out there. Again, if you do not interact with people, that's when you'll end up coming off as awkward. But the reality is, humor is going to be necessary during hard times. People need humor. Yes, how, how long are you going to tell me that you understand me? I don't need you to understand me, and thank you very much for your sympathy. If any of you has experienced loss at the funeral, how many how, how upsetting does it get after a period of time when people keep saying, hey, hey man, pole, pole, all the time? It gets to a point you're like, look, I appreciate that you want that to start with, but then you get to a point when you're like, I need to, I'm, I'm tired of being sad. It weighs down too heavily on people's souls. Look at children, guys. Perfect example. Look at kids. A kid falls, you try and make the kid laugh, the kid gets up, they dust themselves off, they move on. A kid falls, you start going, oh, sorry, 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 the kid starts crying. It's important to be emotional and empathetic at the beginning, but then we get to a point whereby we have to be respectfully funny. People need to escape. And the report, the most recent Twitter marketing report, has over 70 respondents saying that what they really want from brands to do now is, is, is what, sorry, what they really want brands to do now is to go back to normal, to give them better, more positive stories because people are fatigued with the sadness and all the difficulty that they're going through. So I hope that answers that particular question from Amala about that report. Why is there a perception or stereotype that creatives are awkward or crazy? It's a cliche, right? Uh, uh thanks for the the reggae icons <laughs> uh oh okay so about the neck accessory uh if if it comes to the end i will explain it more in detail but if you have a look if you have any friend from ghana ask them about the sankofa s-a-n-k-o-f-a -A. i bought this in a market in, in 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 ghana if they stay at the end i'll explain more what it means but it's a brilliant 
it's a brilliant meaning and uh, it's something that, that I think every creator uh, attests to. So the perception or the stereotype that creatives are awkward, man, come on, we're awkward. Let's be honest. We do not conform. We fit between the lines, isn't it? So society, what is normal for society? For example, if you're creative, how do you go to work? Just let's even start with that. Um, before I joined the industry as a creative, I used to have a regular nine to five. The truth is, you know, I actually went for my first interview. A friend of mine calls me, he's like, hey man, where you at? I'm like, I'm at the pub. He's like, yo, come to my office. I come to his office. So I meet him at the gate right outside the building. He's like, yo, dude, are you interested in a job in advertising? I'm like, huh? What kind of job? What jobs do you have? It's like copyright. I'm like, what the hell is that? Like, oh, you write ads. I'm like, oh, people write ads. I didn't even know people write ads. So I'm like, bro, look, this thing doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't sound very interesting. I don't see it as a big career. Look, I'm, I left my drink at the pub. I'm going to go. And then just as I hailed my board, I turned. I'm like, but hold up. Are you on leave today? What's up? He's like, what do you mean? Because he was in shorts and flip-flops and a T-shirt. And this is during working hours. And I'm like, um... You, you're dressed in a short and t-shirt. He's like, no, no, they I come to work like this. I was like, you know what, if they let you come to work like that, I'm curious, let me come for the interview. And as, as they say, the rest is history. So we are, we are, we are awkward. We, we, we like to believe we're misunderstood, but come on, we, we do behave a bit weird. And we all know, look, in any creative department, there's, there's a bunch of guys in there, you're like, okay, look, I'm cool with working with this guy, but there's no way I'm letting this guy know where I live. We all have those awkward people. So we we yeah. it's okay to not be normal. You know what I mean? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, Nyarinda's question. Um, we have one on Facebook as well from, okay. from Ovita. Ovita asks, what are your thoughts on brands using comedians as conduits okay. of advertising? Thoughts on brands using comedians as conduits of? advertising there's no there's no issue with brands in my opinion using comedians but it's about how you use a comedian you see it depends is um comedians any form of influencer any like athlete i showed you an example of samuel eto i gave you an example of um clint eastwood it's not about who you use it's what message you're using them to deliver the idea comes first you see there was a period of time about eight years ago when there was a big mistake almost every agency was making and this is around the world um yeah. the the person featuring in the ad was the idea so i need something high energy high pace i'm going to use an athlete what's the idea um uh, you know i'm going to use wanyama no that's not the idea oh i need i need some funny shit so i'm going i'm going to i'm going to get a comedian but what's the idea? I think who you use doesn't matter. What you use them to communicate matters and how you use them to communicate. It's about being clever. Look at the Samuel Eto ad I'm referring to. Samuel Eto is not a comedian, but they made him do something funny. He's an athlete. He wasn't kicking a football. He was kicking some pineapples and doing some weird shit. So look, there's nothing wrong with using comedians. Comedians are great. Comedians understand the creative process Comedians are in most cases very easy to work with. They understand direction when you're when you're working with them. They even in many times chip in to whatever you've written. You might write something a particular way, and they're like, no man, let's try this. They I love working with comedians because unlike you see, look, I, I also spent some time in the music industry, so I don't want to 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 drag on musicians, but they're less egos with comedians. And that's the truth. They're great to work with. So if you have a chance to work with a comedian, and you have a brilliant idea, please go ahead, use them. They're, they're great to work with. Super, super. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think that there was a question by Ruthie Stevens initially. Yes. Uh, do you pretest your con in, in, in advertising? Do you pretest your concepts? And if so, how? So this is a very yeah, I get the question. This is a very uh, slippery slope, this particular question. Um, a lot of clients do protest their question. There's a good number of advertisers who believe testing ideas kills um, ideas. And there's a good number who believe testing just makes you sure. 
So the old school uh, do strongly, and I, I, to an extent, I do agree with them. Uh, believe that, you see, what testing and now the how of the testing is, they'll get focus groups, people that represent the target audience. So they'll get about twelve or six people in a room. Say, look, our communication is talking to eighteen to twenty-four year olds. So I'll get six who are in a more middle class setting, six who are in a a lower from a lower uh, economic setting, six from this part of the country. So, and then I'll show them the work and um, see how they react. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know which side of the fence I sit on now. I used to honestly believe that it was a big mistake to do that because 24 or 30 people are not representative of an entire population. But the, the, the one thing is this, um, if you pretest and then you change everything based on every piece of feedback, that's a mistake. But sometimes what pretesting does is it eliminates work that was not true to what the audience would want to see. Remember, I've spoken about understanding people. Unfortunately, think about it. If you're in advertising or in any other creative space, you probably spend about 12 to 16 hours working, especially if you're younger. So when do you get time to interact with people? So what happens is when you spend 15 years in the industry, working 12 hours a day, you might not be in as much touch as you think you are with your consumer. So sometimes you have something that is so brilliant that is extremely creative. And guess what? You walk down the corridor and you share it with Eddie. You walk down the corridor and you share it with Nyerinda. You walk down the corridor, you share it with Amala. They're like, yo, that shit, that's that shit. But then it's within you guys. And then you show it to some people and they're like, ah, no, that's not us. We don't relate. So it helps sometimes uh, to identify stuff that will not work. But sometimes it also does kill brilliant ideas because you're letting the few give the opinion of the many. OK. Um, there, Sorry, uh, yeah, I was trying to find this question. There's somebody is asking with the unsurety of when this will end and the ambiguity of the new normal, there's a void in terms of forecasting on brand communication. Uh, with the unsurety of when this will end and the ambiguity of new normal, there's yeah. a void in terms. It's of forecasting on brand communication. Then she continues, I read a certain report that was very strong in emotional approach rather than humor. Ah, yes. For instance, no, I, did, like I did answer the question. I did answer the question about uh, humor and emotion. And yes, mm -hmm. it's, no, it's ambiguous about the new norm. What's, what's it going to be like? But if you do remember at the very end, I did say adaptability is going to be your biggest uh, skill set. Because if the one thing that is guaranteed is change. That's the one thing that will be guaranteed. Um, the new normal will be very abnormal, guys. It will be, and it will keep shifting. One week it's like, this is what we're supposed to do. Next week it will change, then come back, then go back. So you need to be flexible enough to adapt quickly into whatever the new normal switches to. And I think it will easily take three to four years before it actually plateaus to something that is, is uh, agreeable across the world. So yeah, please stay adaptable, guys. Do not be afraid. Just be ready to to change and be flexible. That's 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 going to be very key for you guys. As we, as we come to a close of the session, uh, mm. most of us here are, are content creators. Basically, yeah. that's why most of them have come here. Mm. Um, what what I can the the running theme that is coming across is how do I communicate. Because mm -hmm. th th there's been that struggle between becoming an influencer where everyone is moving towards that, getting yeah. in the numbers so that I can become an influencer, attract brands, and, you know, push their content. So yeah. what will you advise them to focus on post-COVID? What will you advise them to maybe, just as they are thinking about how they are going to differentiate their, their brands, because everyone knows this is a brand, how they're going to differentiate their brands in this post-COVID era, how would you advise them to go about it? So, uh, look, first and foremost, don't, try, again, as you said, don't try and be like everyone else just for the money. 
you have to figure out what you're good at, what your niche is. Now, interestingly, I know a couple of you are asking, but what is it? I'm trying this, I'm trying that, I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to give you the example of Pablo Picasso. I've been privileged to go to his, uh, to his, uh, his museum in, in, uh, in Barcelona. And one thing I observed, about 60% of the Pablo Picasso museum tour is work in which he was copying other people's styles. His dad was a, was a, a classical art teacher, and that's where he started, just like his dad. And he kept going as he moved to different cities and different parts of the world, uh, emulating different artists. It takes a while before you find your style. Yeah? So find, well, look, you'll have to find your niche earlier than later. Find what you're really great at. Find what people would, be, would find interesting. Sometimes what people try and do is find a niche that is so far removed from what people want to see or hear. Go and research mm. what other people are doing. Look, and one key thing I keep repeating is interact with people. So anyway, as I was saying, Picasso had to explore different people's styles. He almost copied their styles. He mimicked them until he eventually had his inner voice. Ray Charles, the musician from back in the day, again, I'm not snitching on how old I was, but let me be clear, I wasn't, a, I wasn't alive at the time of Ray Charles. That's before my time. But of course, yeah. we saw his movie. Jamie Foxx played that role. It took him a while mimicking other people's styles before he got his own sound. And many musicians will tell you that. It takes you a while to get your own sound. It will take you a while. And I know you're worried you want to get in and get in now. But the patient one who decides to consolidate who they are is the one who re reap the bigger benefits. If you want to switch and just be compatible what, for what's being asked for now, that's all you'll be. You'll be good for now. But if you're looking for that long-term long big paper, that big money, you have to be willing to craft something that can only be you. So first of all, understand yourself. Who are you as a person? What's your personality? What are you good at? What can you speak of or speak about with authority? You know, what, piece, what kind of content can you create that cannot easily be mimicked? And then that's what you should share to, with the world. But also, just interact with people and you get a better understanding of what people want to see. You cannot know if you do not walk in their shoes or at least share a drink with them and have a conversation to understand what it's like to walk in their shoes. Super. Now, Ovita has a, has a question that I was also thinking about asking about mm. uh, brands using, become, uh, riding on controversy. Mm. Say, so for instance, mm. I really remember the ad about the H&M, the monkey. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. 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 And, and if you bring it much home closer, just yesterday, Anita Nderu, I'm sure you've yes. seen that. Yeah. Yes, so yes, yes. I'm not privy to the sources, the information, but what I'm sure about is that the way that fresh fry was placed there, that, mm -hmm. that was a ad. Yeah. And fresh yeah. distance itself from the communication just mm -hmm. goes to prove that it was actually paid for clout. And now yes. they have the capability, people are talking about it. So, what, what is your. Uh, what is your thoughts on, on such? This question is, relates very strongly to what we're just talking about and what people want to do with their, with their content creation. Yeah. So if you want eyeballs, if you want people to talk about you for now, yeah, go ahead. In my opinion, it's lazy. It's a lazy way of going about things. Long term is to build a brand. If you want the quick buck, if you want the quick eyeballs, yeah, yeah, feel free. Create the controversy. Now, there's ways of doing controversy and doing it well. Does it sit within your brand? Are you, for example, has anyone seen, I'm, I'm, okay, sorry, I'm asking the entire room, but if any of you have seen the, the Coke is a Fanta in Brazil, that's a perfect example of quoting controversy in the right way. So I can just quickly take you, also just go online, look for the case study, but I can talk you through it. So Coke is a Fanta, was a derog is still a derogatory term used in Brazil in reference to LGBTQ community. So it would be like, oh, that Coke is a Fanta in reference to that guy is gay or that lady is, is a lesbian, yeah? Mm -hmm. That Coke mm -hmm. is a Fanta. So what did Coke do? Coke actually went and took ownership of that line. And for a gay pride or a gay day parade, I can't remember, they actually produced Coke cans with Fanta inside. Now, if you ask me, that's brilliant. 
because you're owning the narrative. Now, if Coke had gone and created that Coke is a Fanta as a, as a negative statement and put it out there to get the eyeballs, then that for me is just lazy and should never be done. However, it depends. Do you want the ROI? Do you want the money right now? You will make the money. You will get the eyeballs. So if you want to be lazy and get the immediate return, please go ahead and be like H&M and create that controversy. But if you want to think long term, your brand cannot just be about controversy because how many, for how long can you be controversial? If you start off with controversy, you're going to have to be controversial again and again and again. And which is a point whereby you're controversial too many times, you're no longer controversial, you're notorious. You, get, you have notoriety. It's not good for the brand, if you ask me. It's something I would avoid if I could, you see. So look, it works in the short term. Long term, yes. no. Mm. Yeah. Okay. As we, we have six minutes, uh, maybe I'll, I'll read a few comments from the guys, which are not questions. Okay. The Arinda says, I guess creatives just exist then, which is beautiful. There's no pretense in creative spaces. Yeah. Mm. She will research more on the Sankofa. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but you need to tell us that story at least before you leave. <laughs> uh, Slade Jeff, who runs a comedy blog, uh, says Picasso had a crazy catalog as well, over 50k paintings. However, when he found himself, he got really good. What made him famous were like 10 paintings. So, content creators need volume, which I agree because yeah. I think if you've read Malcolm Gladwell's Outlier, he talks about the 10,000 rule. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, before we close, uh, Yegon, do you want to say some, something before Alemu tells us the story of his Sankafa as he Sankofa. closed the discussion for us? Um, no, yeah. really. Um, yeah. Not really a comment, but just reading through what people have been saying throughout this conversation. Um, I think a lot of people relate with the aspect of humor. Uh, that, you know, it brings about the issue of adaptability and relatability with the audiences. So uh, that is, I think, one of the writing things that people are getting out of this conversation. Um, the aspect of fluidity and adapt adaptability and, yes, uh, humor. So probably if something else comes up, Eddie, that you're going to miss, uh, if you miss any of it, then uh, I'll let you know on this end, but we can let Alemu then... Uh, go on with his uh, closing remarks. Okay. Um, I know, Eddie, you asked about, let me tell you a story of the Sankofa, but I think you guys can Google that. I think what's important, just when you spoke about uh, Malcolm Gladwell, those 10,000 hours, guys, um, and that, that what you spoke of, uh, Picasso's catalog, it takes mm -hmm. a lot of work to become good. Because you need to do a lot of bad work to, ha to finally have the skill set to do good work. I keep telling, you see, I'm lucky that my mentors, when I was a young writer, for one layout, I used to have to write 100 headlines before one could be approved. And sometimes none were. I'd have to write 36 radio spots to get one approved. Not because I had to, but then it taught me. You see, a lot, a lot of young people have this question, when will I get there? I was a creative director um, four years into the industry. I was the first black creative director in, in Uganda for an, a multinational advertising agency before I turned 30. Why? Because I sacrificed the time. The fact is there's no shortcut, guys. Talent is necessary. Do, no doubt about that. If you're creative, there's a high probability you're talented. If you want to get where you, where you want to go, man, you're going to have to just put in the hours. So it's up to you. If you can spend your 10,000, you can spread your 10,000 hours over... 10 years, you could do it in four years or whatever it is. It's up to you. The more work you put in, the faster you get to your destination. There's simply no other way. You have to keep doing and doing and become better and become better. Look at Cristiano Ronaldo, perfect example. There's a reason why Cristiano Ronaldo is where he is and Wayne Rooney is not. They're about more or less, I think, not the same age. Wayne Rooney was more talented. Cristiano Ronaldo worked harder. You will have to yes. put in the hard work, guys. So that that's one one. Thing that I did not want to, this to end without uh, without you guys knowing. Yeah. So uh, hard work is going to be key. Thank you so much for the session of today. 
Alemu. It was yeah. pretty insightful. Guys, I'll share with you the presentation, but I, I'll talk to Alemu. Remember, but it's also on Facebook. We, so this video is live on Facebook, so you'll find out, you'll find it practically everything there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There was one question, but I don't think we have time to delve into that from Slade. He was asking what makes good copy, but I think you've covered it by saying practice, you know, because at the end of the day, we are creatives and practice is all that you will take us to be good, to reach the level. So we uh, remember your homework for today is find out about the Sankofa and then meet our two yeah. questionnaires. I love when whoever gets from Bayer credit me na lemo. And yes. look, guys, um, Eddie, I don't know. I know there'll probably be a lot of questions. Uh, yes. look, you, you can reach, if you're Eddie's friend, reach out. He has my number. I can, yeah. you can give me a call anytime. Knowledge is to be shared, guys. What I know, I will tell you with the hope exactly. that it benefits you. Yeah. And if there's a exactly. lot of other questions, we can do this another time. Maybe even next Friday. I don't know. Up to you, Eddie. I'm yes, available yes. to help and give as much info as I can. I've been exactly. blessed to that. And I'd like yeah. to pass that on by, by, by sharing what I know. So, hey man, feel free to reach out at any time. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. just solve the problem of that hacking guy because he's, he's cost us a lot of guys as well. <laughs> so, no, once no, we solve no. that problem, I'll, yeah. I'll call you up. With, yeah. uh, I'll do a deep stick research of what people want maybe in the next yeah. session and yeah. then we'll talk offline, you and I. No problem, but, no problem at all. Yeah. Thank you so much for this session. And thank you guys for everyone who has attended. You guys are the best from Amala, Ruthie Stevens, Nyarinda, Sled Jeff, um, Boya Atieno, uh, Marvin. So many guys, I can't even uh, mention all of them. But this was awesome. And we yeah. thank you for the short notice. You know what has happened between us offline. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. no problem. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. See you on the next one, my people. Okay. Au revoir. Thank you. All right.